my life as an execution witness in America's most infamous prison. It sort of delivers exactly what it says on the tin. Yes. But when you were on your way here and I was waiting for you to arrive, I, 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 I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Presumably you get a lot of this. Do you? I, I thought there might be a sort of Morticia Adams element to your personality. And the minute you came through the door, you were a boolean, upbeat. We've been swapping tips on good pubs to drink in in London <laughs> while you were here. You have a, you know, infectious laugh. You have a clear joy in the world around you. And yet most of your working life has been about death. It is somewhat ironic. I, I think hopefully that's what helped me be resilient after leaving that job um, and what made some of it so complicated for me. Um, yes. You know, and, and that's actually something that we talk about in the book yes. is that this is largely my personality. This is how I am. And there was actually this one instance where I thought that I was being very good about not letting it get to me. It wasn't affecting me. And I had gone into my doctor's office for, you know, my annual checkup. And the nurse there asked if everything was okay. And I said, yeah, of course. Why? She said, because you're you're not light like you normally are okay. and stuff. And I, I, it really bothered me when I left because I thought, here I thought that I had this great facade still going on and I, I don't think that it... Well, we can never know for sure, can we, what's going no. on under the bonnet? Because I suppose we put so much effort into not just presenting an image to the world, but also keeping ourselves on an even keel by sort of by clinging to that, 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 that notion of normality. We've already leapt far ahead into the future. Let's begin at the beginning. Sure. Your, your dad was a journalist. Yes. A police reporter. So that's a fascinating beat in America. My dad was a journalist as well. Okay. And um, the local news beat that he started on would, would gen generally and genuinely involve, you know, covering everything from a lost cat up a tree right through to, <laughs> to a local murder. W yes. w when did you decide you wanted to follow him into that kind of world? Not for a bit. Um, in fact, I was, you know, the typical rebellious American teen. I did not want to do it because my parents wanted me to do it. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I was always a strong writer. Yes. And so, of course, my parents thought, oh, you should go into journalism because of this. So I thought, OK, well, then what is the opposite of journalism? I'll go into business. Mm. And I entered college. That was my major. And I realized really quickly how absolutely horrible I was at business <laughs> math, um, was going to flunk the class. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to have to look for a new career path. And I took a journalism class. And I hated to admit that I really, really loved it. And um, that is the path then that I, I chose. And the, the, there's a juxtaposition with both your parents here, because your mum works at the police department. Yes, she was the records keeper, and that's how my parents met. Talk me through this line here. When I was a little girl, I would lie in bed at night and cry, thinking about all the people I loved who were going to die. I don't know what that was about, but for some reason it was on Sunday nights. Something about Sundays, and and to be honest, it still happens to me a little. I don't not, I don't lay in bed and cry, but no. um, for something, Sundays are a, kind of a sad day. I don't know if it's because it's the end of a weekend sure. or, or what it is, but even as a child, um, on Sundays, I would very vividly remember that I would lay in bed and it would be time to go to bed because, of course, school is on Monday. And instead, it would just occur to me that all of these people that I loved were someday going to die. And I, I don't know where it came from because I was young. And that's probably not a very normal thought no. for a young child to have. I would say I had to have been anywhere between maybe 10 and 12, maybe 13. Yes. Um, and I would just cry. And it never occurred to me either to go and try and tell my parents for them to comfort me. It just was something I thought about until I went to bed and was okay until the next Sunday. And still don't know why. It no. wasn't some sort of sort of terrible experience or something like that that no. prompted you to fear mortality. No, not your, not because your own in fact, I really didn't either. lose anyone close to me sure. um, until I was much older. So, no, I really don't know why. And then by the time you were 16, you, you were working at the evening news developing photographs. Yes. Um that sounds relatively straightforward until a year later you're a photographer and you're covering, as we've just touched upon, car wrecks and, and, and fires and things like that. It's, yes. It's, it's quite an odd path. Were you conscious at the time that this, this most 17-year-old girls wouldn't be taking pictures of car wrecks? No, no. It didn't occur to me. No, I guess because I, I grew that. up in the journalism business, yeah. so it didn't seem particularly weird. Um, and this was a really small town. My dad was the publisher of the newspaper there. And traditionally, the darkroom technician and photographer had always been a high school student. And so when we moved there, I just took on that role. Um, so no, it, it, there had been other 
high school students before me who had done it. Tell, tell, tell us about how you got the job on the f- paper that your father published without your father <laughs> without your father knowing that you. <laughs> I was um, working at a daily newspaper in the Bryan College Station, Texas area, which is where I went to school. I went mm. to Texas A and M University, and um, they had done some switches on the beats, and I wasn't happy with what they had given me and such. So I was looking for another job. I knew that my dad's paper needed a reporter. And I thought, he's probably not going to hire me. So I just didn't go through him. I thought, well, in a normal paper, you would go through the managing editor and they would make the decision. And so that's what I did. I contacted the managing editor. I sent over some clips and told him I'd like to work there. And uh, we had an interview and he hired me and it was great. And then he went and told my dad, you know, good news. We've hired a reporter. Yeah. And my dad said, well, no, that's great. Who is it? And he said, it's your daughter. And then my dad um, later told me he was super apprehensive because he thought, oh, God. You know, or, it was a strange dynamic. He didn't. He knew you were good, presumably, but there's yes. a different level of communication involved if it's your dad in charge and your oh, daughter of course. on the You end don't want to be phone. accused of favoritism and I all that. I can't do this job, otherwise I'm not going to be able to get to mum's for Thanksgiving. <laughs> exactly. It's the perfect excuse. Exactly. You tell mum I won't be there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you have a perfectly built-in ex- yeah, system. But, um, yeah, no, he was worried that people would think that he favored me, so he went the other way and was just, you know, much more... Uh, he was harder on me. Yes, well, yeah. I guess that's inevitable because he has <laughs> to prove he's path. not. He proves he's not favoriting you. Exactly. So, so he leads too far in the other direction. I, I just, yes. I'm, I'm trying to knit together these early years because you, you, you write in the book, looking back, it seems inevitable that I'd end up working in death, and which, it, <laughs> I mean, it, it's quite a sweeping statement, but you do offer up quite a lot of evidence of how, how you arrive at that conclusion, but. It wouldn't be fair to describe you as being drawn to it, though, would it? I mean, you were drawn towards news. News often is Hmm. bad. In fact, most news is bad in terms of what gets reported in newspapers. Why why do you say that? Why do you say it seems inevitable that I'd end up working in death? Well, and too, prior to taking the role at the Huntsville Item, my first job at the Brian Eagle before... Um, obituaries. Yes, but I was the open not, girl. Is this a coincidence? Or, I mean, did you put your it hand up totally for it? It was totally coincidence. No, and that's why I guess it seemed inevitable. Because yeah. it's like I just over and over again, I, I keep getting these assignments. And once I got them, I found them interesting. Yes. But it just seemed like I was kind of always drawn to that topic. And you're probably right. I mean, news tends to have a bad element, but there are other beats. You could be covering education, which I also covered. But honestly, at that time, especially I'm I'm young and I'm this hungry reporter, education's boring. You want to cover the police news and where the fires and the breaking news are. And and that's usually not going to be like the education beat or covering city hall and politics. I guess not. Although, I mean, politics arguably engages the brain more than than other sort of brands of journalists because you're yes. bringing the analysis along with the reporting. Yes. The, I, I mean, the, the other story that we've glossed over is when you turned up at the scene of one car wreck to discover that it had involved a, a schoolmate, you, you balked at that, didn't you? I don't want anybody to, to think that you're some sort of impermeable... No. Um, uh, you know, carapace of of of, of coolness that, that that affected you deeply. You couldn't go through with that one. No, and I was I was still in high school at the time and, and was taking photos for that local paper. And um, I did show up at the scene because it was a breaking news and it was a pretty bad accident. And I was taking photos from further away and then realized it was someone I knew. And my dad, we had actually been driving somewhere together when we saw it. So we we were got out of the car together and um, he kept telling me to get in closer, which is that's mm. normal advice that yes. you would give a photographer. And I finally just flipped a little bit and, and told him, I'm, I'm not, I know her and I can't do this. Yes. And, you know, kind of shoved the camera at him and walked off. And yeah, I guess, uh, you know, it was fine covering when it wasn't someone I knew. When you, when you then were sort of earning your spurs a few years later on the Huntsville item, what would your ambitions have been then? If someone had said to you, Michelle, where do you want to be in 20 years time? What would you, I mean, had you framed those sort of thoughts? I really didn't think I would ever leave journalism. I loved being a newspaper reporter. So really my, my goal was to go to a large daily. Um, and I, I had applied, but it, it's hard, you know, as you know, from being in journalism to make a huge jump like that, to go from a really small newspaper to the Chicago Tribune, which is what I would have loved to have done because I love Chicago yes. or, you know, to go to even the Houston Chronicle. It's it's not easy to make that jump. But that's what my intention was to eventually end up at a large daily. But it didn't happen. No, um, I would never have left journalism, but... The opportunity presented itself for me to be a spokesperson for their prison system. And that was truly the first time that I even had contemplated leaving journalism 
for something that I really found fascinating. I found the prisons fascinating. Not the executions, but the prisons themselves. You, it happened by accident, didn't it? You were filling in for someone else when you first, who generally covered the executions at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And, and the first one, Javier Cruz, I think, that you attended, you were, you were covering for a colleague. So you weren't drawn to that beat, or were you? Is, you can tell what I'm trying to pin down on this, yeah. is, is how much of it happened by accident and how much of it happened by design. Well... I witnessed my first execution in 1998, and and as you said, it was because the woman who normally covered that beat had to be somewhere else. So I was called in just to witness that one execution, and I was briefed on what to expect and everything, and I went and covered it, and it was fine in the way that... Can you remember what happened? Can you just talk us through it? Because obviously the massive majority of people listening to this at the moment will have absolutely no idea what that involves, and and more so than in America when when you... Tell your story in America, at least there's a vocabulary of familiarity. But for us, it's still it's still quite alien. Yeah, actually. very foreign concept, sure. For sure. Um, when you're a reporter and you witness the execution, interestingly enough, you don't show up until about an hour before the execution is scheduled to begin. Um, so you show up and you meet with the press officer and you're given this packet of information. And in it, you have the synopsis of the crime, of course, the normal type stuff mm. you would expect. Then you have this last meal request. And here's some documentation about how he's been spending his last three days, a little snapshot of everything he's been doing and some some interesting material like that. And then you just wait. You're really sitting for that hour waiting until 6 o'clock, which is when in Texas the executions can begin. Right. Um, why is that? Why, why do they have that ruling? place? Well, you know, it used to be at midnight. Yeah. And the problem, of course, was um, somewhat logistical in that if you had inmates who had appeals pending, you have lawyers that are scrambling in the middle of the night to try and reach these judges at right. 1 and 2 in the morning. And yes. it just didn't make sense. Sure. It's better to do during the workday, of course. Yes. And so um, it went to 6 o'clock. And that gave um, the courts and everyone time and access that, that they didn't have previously. But... When it was time for the execution to begin and assuming that all the appeals had been exhausted, we were escorted across the street from um, the administration building. That's where the unit is, where the executions take place. And we were led to the execution viewing areas. And there are two. So the way that it's set out just to kind of, I guess, give listeners an idea is that there's basically a large room, and in that room, there's really nothing except for the execution gurney and a small, like a step stool. And a gurney is like a bed on wheels. So the, the, like a, the a hospital. It's not, yeah, this a one, hospital. of course, is bolted to the floor, sure. and um, it, it's like a hospital bed. Yeah. But this one is different in that it has two arms, that, so an arm that extends from either side. Mm. Um, so that when the inmate is laying on the gurney and he puts his arms out, his arms are strapped to those gurneys so that he cannot move them. Um, and then his body, of course, is, is yeah. strapped to the rest of their gurney. And as a witness, when you go inside, there are one of two rooms that you will be escorted into. There is one room closest to the inmate's head, and that's where the victim's family goes. And then the room right next door is where the inmate's family goes. Right. And they are separated by a wall. So those two families never see each other. I mean, it is perfectly choreographed where they never will see one another. Um, But they can't hear each other. And we do talk about that in the book because it it used to bother me that there were times when I would be with the victim's family and you could very clearly hear the inmate's mother sobbing or Mm. wailing or somebody's hitting the glass and such. And I thought, you know, if if it's troubling to me, I can't imagine how the victim's family must feel. But... um, when you you enter as a media witness, you're going to be with either the victim's family or the inmate's family. And that, that, that's a formal role, is it? It's, it's, it's you, you witness it on behalf of the public or on behalf of to just to be certain that it's happened, to be able to report back. Because when you mention mm-hmm. the last meal and the details of what he's been doing for the last few days, mm-hmm. that sounds like you're preparing what we'd call a color piece, for want of a slightly better word. You're, you're putting together a feature article that brings in lots of different things. But the way you speak about being a witness, there's a there's an almost a constitutional element to that role, is there? Well, you know, interestingly, there in in the state statute, yeah. there are role or I'm sorry, spots that are actually dedicated to certain media. So the Associated Press 
is guaranteed a spot for every execution to witness. And so there is a reporter from the Associated Press who attends every execution. And then the Huntsville item, because they are the local paper. So, of course, as the prison reporter, I was guaranteed a spot, and it was my duty as that reporter to go for every execution because, I mean, there's an execution being carried out in our town. And the role, I mean, I'm I'm sure it's it's partly your— acting on behalf of the public, but no, you're, you're there as a journalist to report. And it's important. I found when I was an actual press officer Mm. to make sure that we did distribute the reporters on both sides, because in my mind, especially the reporters needed to be able to document anything that would be happening in both of those rooms. And so if something happens um, on the inmate side or the victim side, it, the journalists are there to be able to report on that and let the public know what exactly is happening. And We've jumped ahead again. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, that's I do fine. that a I'm lot. Gonna, I'm going to drag you back to the chronology. That's, <laughs> Please uh, do. Sorry uh, about that. No, don't, don't, don't be. Um, but I want to talk to you about privacy. Remind me. Because the thing is we're both journalists. Yeah. We can yeah. do a little bit of a – we'll both have a background in journalism yes. at least. Yes. So back, back to that first one that, that, that you were attended um you were 22 years old yes you talk about it now very matter of factly you you I mean you make it clear in the book as you've already alluded to that the matter of factness sometimes perhaps is a is a suit that you put on even if you don't realize that you're doing it but would you have been as matter of fact when you were 22 I mean given because it's the dad's role your dad's role in all of this and it's the I can tell you now that British people listening and watching will be we, we, we will struggle to understand how it could all have been such a normal progression for you because mm-hmm. for us it is it is so out of our comfort zone, so out of our realm of experience. So I'm, I'm sensing that even at 22, this was, albeit remarkable in many ways, it was just part of the job in other ways. It was. I think... Um well, and you, and you have to understand, of course, too, growing up in Texas. Yes, because this is what I'm trying to get yeah, to. The yeah, idea, because I'm sitting here, I grew up in Kidderminster, sure. which is a small town in Worcestershire, and the idea of a public execution, it's it's yeah. up there with with a, with a visit to the moon. Of course. Right? So, yeah. whereas for you, it's almost right. at the bottom of the garden. Right. No, and and you know, in Texas, and growing up in Texas, I mean, capital punishment is something that has really always been. Um, Yes. An, an option yes, it's a for, constant for individuals, presence. yes, who've committed capital murder. And so I don't necessarily remember following it growing up or even as a young journalist until I moved to Huntsville. Um, just two months prior to me moving to Huntsville, there was a huge execution of the first woman in Texas, Carla Faye Tucker. And I was literally going to school. You know, my university was 45 minutes away. Mm. I didn't follow one thing about yeah. it because it just... It was something that was present in Texas, so you just didn't give thought to it. Um, So when I moved to Huntsville and knew that that was what was done in Huntsville and then being asked to go and and actually cover it, it didn't seem out of ordinary because it's something that there was always a reporter there that was covering that. Of course. And there you were, the, 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 the image of the arms being strapped. Again, you know, I lean towards uh, the apocalyptic now. I'm seeing almost crucifixion style imagery, but you're just seeing... Prison officers do their job. Yes, yes. And, you know, the, there was one inmate that when we were watching the execution, I know I'm jumping ahead, but it's just right. to your point, there was one inmate who once made that comment. He said, look, I'm a cross, yeah. um, which I'd never considered before. Never had I looked at it and thought, it looks just like a cross, but yeah, because it's, I guess, horizontal, I, I didn't mm. picture it. But, yes, that is so, exactly what it looks like. Again, back to the sort of, I don't want to say detail because that sounds mawkish, but the the process hmm. once 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 the inmate is strapped down, then what happens? Once all of the witnesses are brought in, and and two the witnesses don't watch that process at all. Once so he's already yes restrained by the time the and the, the IV lines are in place. So once he's restrained before the public or the witnesses come in. The IV team comes and establishes the the IV lines and a saline solution starts pumping. Then the witnesses are brought in. So they do not see any part of that. Later I would, and we can talk about that. But um, the victims are brought in first, then the inmate's family. And then once everybody is is still, the rooms are secured, that's when the warden uh, will be given a signal that he can proceed. And he will ask the inmate if he wants to make a last statement. And did Javier Cruz make a last name? I'll be honest, I don't remember. There were a lot of details about the first execution that I didn't remember. I remember, you know, being asked a lot of questions before I went, if I was going to be able to handle it or not. I remember the details of the crime. 
um, what he did. I remember he he killed these two elderly men with a hammer. Mm. And so I remember, oh, my gosh, this was such a horrible crime. And then I watched the execution, and it was this very clinical and very sterile process, and it was over so quickly. And then I went back to the newsroom, and everybody wanted to know if I was okay because this was mm. the first time I'd seen this. And I thought I was, and I felt a little bit concerned about that because I thought, yeah. Is it normal that I'm okay? But then I thought, well, no, I'm a journalist. This, mm. this is what I'm supposed to do. I wrote my story and I went home. And so, you know, it, it is a little bit bizarre that I don't remember more about it. But I think um, there was so much, you know, uncertainty going into it and then to go into it. And it was such a quick process that when I left, I maybe was a little bit bewildered by how fast it was. Yes, but that's the thing, isn't it, that comes mm. across, is it, it's almost perfunctory, mm. the process, even with the attendant emotion, the actual, well, the science of it is, yeah. is surprisingly perfunctory. Yes. Um, two years later, you, you took the prison beat permanently. Yes. So were there any intervening experiences? No. Um, in between, so I, we, I really had nothing to do much with covering prisons. So in you between. were back to doing normal news. Yes. I covered city government yes. and lots of feature stories and such. Did that float your boat? I mean, no. you, because you, I thought you were going to say that. Because you, So were you thinking all the time, I want to get back into into the, the, the TDCJ? I want to get back on that side of... No, not necessarily. Honestly, I was probably more thinking about going to a larger paper. That would have been my goal. And then, so it was the size of the pond that was frustrating you, not the nature of the... No, it was the beat, you know, yeah. and a little bit the size of the pond. Okay. I thought, oh, well, maybe I can move to a larger paper and I'll get some sure. really exciting beat. But I, I did like the community of Huntsville, okay. but again, I'm young and I yeah, want to yeah. go to a city. Oh, well, I get that. And um, then the, the prison beat came up and I, I thought, you know, I should take this opportunity because... What fascinated me about the prisons was that there were all of these these factors that nobody considered, you know, and all these industries in the prisons that nobody knew anything about. So, um, like, one at one of the units, there's this computer refurbishing plant. Right. So all of these old state or these state agencies have all these old computers that don't work well, and they ship them to this one prison unit. And these inmates learn how to work on computers, which is a huge marketable job skill. They learn how to work on them and load them with new software and everything, and then they're sent to low-income school districts. I mean, this is a great program. Yeah, it's a great story. Nobody knows about it. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I can do all of these stories. I knew the executions were a part of it, but they were a small part. And I thought, oh, I'll just have to do these once in a while, not knowing that in 2000 there would be 40 executions carried out. Which is pretty much one a week by the time you've had your holiday. It was a lot, and yes. more than Texas had ever carried out, Why more than that? any state. Why was that? What, what was the political context? Uh, a, a lot of people, well, it was the year that, that he was then governor, that mm. George Bush was running for president, and a lot of people thought that the two things were linked. Did you? Yeah, probably, but, you know, again, I wasn't really sure because I had, hadn't covered it before. It did seem odd that prior to that, there hadn't been anywhere near that number of executions. And then he's running for president as the governor of Texas, and suddenly there are 40. And it plays to to a certain part of the Republican base then, that, that notion of being a very, a very strong governor. But it's not the governor that has any role in setting the date. So there right. was also speculation that it was Democratic judges who uh, wanted to keep heat on him. To make him look blood that were, yeah. Yes. Okay. So really nobody who knows. knows. No. Yeah, nobody <laughs> knows. But, I mean, it, it seemed like it was more than a coincidence, but nobody could say for sure who was driving it. So, I mean, that was the year you started, 40 people in, in your, in your yes. first year, and people yes. started um, – I, I, I suppose reeling slightly from the scale, the, the liberal establishment would reel slightly from the scale of death, and others, others less so. You, you don't. I, I, if I use the phrase moral investment, it, 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 you, you, you couldn't do your job with a moral investment in what was going on, really, could you? You couldn't. I mean, you, you, I know you are comfortable in principle with the death penalty, and as we learn a little more about the 300 executions that you've personally, almost 300 that you've personally witnessed. I know that the personal encounters almost offered up a cognitive dissonance with the principle. So yes, in principle, I am in favour. But actually, now that I know this guy, now that I've seen the whites of his eyes, I know about his family, I know his background, I, I, especially in the case of the 17 year old lad who you write about, there's mm. a there's a poignancy to it. But you presumably 
wouldn't have lasted five minutes in this job if you'd been spending huge amounts of emotional energy trying to decide whether or not the death penalty was justified or not. You you work throughout on the principle it just it's it's there. It's as much a part of our penal system as prison itself. That is exactly oh, what, what my mind. <laughs> you have it spot on. No, that you know what that is absolutely what what was going on with me because no, and and I say this in the book. I don't think if I had ever really stopped and and gotten on a deep level with what I was doing and mm. thinking, you know, I'm mm. watching a soul leave this body. Um, I'm really watching the final moments of this person's existence. And if I had really started down that line of thinking, there's no possible way that I would have been able to do it. Day after day and then year after year, uh, there's just, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have kept going on. And I think what's interesting was that in the beginning, I was keeping this journal. When I'd get back, I'd write some lines in this yes. little online little blog. And anyway, I say blog. I mean, it was only for me. Mm. Never thought I would do anything with it. It was just so I could kind of keep my thoughts organized. Yeah. And I just stopped one day. And I don't remember why, but when I kind of uncovered it going through some papers and such, it was so bizarre to me that it just suddenly drops off and I stopped doing it. And I think it had to have been at some point where I realized, you know what, even coming back to the newsroom and typing this, it's a little bit too much. I need to just completely move on. Are after. you good at compartmentalizing other areas of your life? Do yes. You're very good at keeping things separate and very good. not letting one seep into the other. Yes. No, I'm very how, good at that. How did this sort of, I mean, as a 22-year-old girl, I'm interested in what happened when you were dating and stuff like that, when, when people found out what you did. Again, I'm conscious throughout our conversation of how unremarkable it is to a Texan. Mm -hmm. And how remarkable it is to a Brit. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's, that, that, that is a bridge we're never going to meet on, is yeah. it? Because of our own respective backgrounds. But again, yeah. possibly you'll say to me, well, everyone in Texas, every, you know, every, all my friends and any kind of people that I, I, I wanted to hook up with, it was all normal for them as well. There was never any kind of morbid fascination in what you were doing? Oh, there was definitely morbid right. fascination okay. in it. Um, I used to get uncomfortable. I mean, I I really didn't talk about it at times. No. I mean, my friends knew what I did, and they loved to tell people about it, which would make me uncomfortable. Yes, I remember course. going to visit a friend of, of mine in Dallas, and we'd gone to this hot little pub or in you know, a little bar, and there were some cute guys we were yeah. talking to, and they asked what we do, and she lit up and oh, couldn't no. wait to tell them. And I thought, oh, my God, they're immediately going to think that I'm just this horrible garish, and, you know, mm. no. They start peppering me with questions, and that's not really what you want to chat about when you're out having a pint, you know, no, or of course. Um, and then there were times that I actually just lied about it. Right. I remember being on a flight to Las Vegas. I was traveling alone to meet a friend and um, some folks, we were chatting on the plane and they asked me what I did. And I told them I was a teacher because I thought, because no one can just, nobody's going to ask me a whole bunch of questions. But <clears throat> no one's going to hear the truth and not ask you a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. Are they? It's, 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 no. You don't have to be. A genius to work that out for yourself. No, if I say I'm a teacher, the only follow up I may get oh, is nice. what grade? Yeah, yeah, sure. What do you <laughs> that's teach? it. Children. And I'd already planned that too. It was kindergarten. That was it. G g give me an idea before we look at the, the the two years you did on that beat, and then the step over the line, as it were, from from reporting on it to being part of mm -hmm. it of the justice system. How big a role does does the um, department play in Huntsville? It's the biggest employer, I think, isn't it? So there's a there's a constant presence, presumably. Most, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it is the biggest employer in Huntsville. And then, you know, we're divided into counties in Texas. So Walker County is where Huntsville is. And it is the largest employer in Walker County. So if you don't work there in some capacity, whether you're an officer, or you work in an administrative office or payroll or technology, wherever, you know somebody who works there. You have a family member who works there. Um, it, everybody is is in some way affiliated with the prison system, it seems like, in Huntsville, other than there is a large university there, Sam sure. Houston State. Yeah. But even then, it's centered around criminal justice. It's is got it? a huge criminal justice program. Yeah. And, I mean, as, as you then begin to report upon on these executions, 40 in your first year, how, fewer in your state. There weren't as many in 2001, were there? No. Nowhere near as many. No. So what's the difference between, it's going to sound very odd, but, but, but between one execution and the next one? I mean, if you've done 40 in a year, don't, don't, don't things get a bit rep repetitious? No. And I think it would have been really alarming if they had. Well, I do as know, well, but I'm interested because, in why you think it didn't. Well, because every, okay, the, the movements are the same. The procedure yeah. is the same, but all the characters change. Yes. 
And so you don't know going into each one what's going to happen. You have no idea what the victims are going to do and how they're going to react. You have no idea what the inmate's family is going to do. And you have no idea what that inmate's going to say when they're on the gurney. And that can change the entire story just like that. Um, you know, there, because there were times that the inmate might make the most profound, apologetic statement, and there were times that they might launch into an angry, just uh, expletive, uh, it, you know, laced tirade. Yes, of course. And so you never knew. And so, no, they, they were also different. Um, everything from the last meals that they requested to um, – whether or not the victims chose to give a press conference afterwards and talk about what they had just seen, everything had the potential to, to be different and often was. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. In so far as you're describing the humanity of each different case, mm -hmm. which is an odd thing to focus on, isn't it, when you think about what was actually happening? Because I would have thought it would be easier to do this job. And again, I'm working on the presumption that it's difficult when, of course, it isn't necessarily difficult if, 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 if it, it is just part of what you've always known. But I would have thought you'd almost have to deny the humanity of the criminal, deny the humanity of the condemned man in order to be able to, to, to witness 40 in a year. But you, you never did that. I think I tried to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I took over the beat, aside from writing all of those features that I was so excited yes. about, because I was taking on the executions, I knew that I needed to try and interview as many of these men as possible before the execution because that's what a good journalist would do. Right. And so I would put in requests to interview them prior to the execution a week or two in advance. And so I started going to death row pretty regularly and meeting these men and hearing their side of the story. And then I'd... Why did they want to talk to you, do you think, just to get something on the record? Yeah, I think in a lot of cases. And they, the Associated Press would do the same thing. Yeah. He would go and talk to all the reporters and um, to get something on the record or get things off their chest mm. or have their side of the story presented. And then, again, being a journalist, you know, I would call the prosecutors and sometimes try and get in touch with the victim's family if I could and um, try and really present this well-rounded story. But in doing so and going to meet these inmates, you're, you're meeting someone face-to-face -face and that person that you're meeting and these details on a piece of paper that are sometimes, I mean, just horrendous of yeah. this crime, those two things aren't reconciling. And that's confusing. You know, you're you're reading and this person is a monster based yes. on this crime that you're reading about. Then you go and you chat with them and you're chatting like you and I might be chatting. And it's it's very bizarre. Can you remember the first time? I mean, perhaps it didn't dawn on you quite like this, but but when you sort of thought, oh, I, I quite like you. <laughs> there were several in that first year, you know, and it, yeah, it would be bizarre. I mean, there were times that I'd sit there and think, you know, under different circumstances, I think I would be friends with this person. Yes. I could see us going to the pub and having a drink together. And um, then I would think, oh, my God, what is wrong with you? Uh, this is a death row inmate, you know. <laughs> so I never said those things out loud, no, but course. I would think them. Yes, yeah. of course. And uh, when you're doing that, when you're having that kind of engagement, I guess we'd call it, I, I presume that there's a cynicism in some of the journalism involved in that your internal dialogue will be saying, well, this is a better story than last week's or not. You know, I can honestly say I don't think I, I, think I, I don't would. thought that. I, don't think I, I think I'm nastier than you, even though I'm completely <laughs> gobsmacked by the concept of yeah. what you were doing. Yeah. I suspect once I'd got used to it, I would be actually thinking, would oh, this, one, this one's got this one's got page lead written all over it or something like that. Really? I no. think, well, maybe not. No. Why not? I don't know. Well, that's I just, what you were there for. You were there to get as good a story as you could. So you must true. have had some sort of calibration in your mind going that... Not that I ever remember thinking, oh, no, okay, these let me quotes phrase... are not nearly as good as last week's. <laughs> let's, let's never thought that. that. even more You're awful, awful than I did. James. I'm <laughs> leaving. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, <laughs> but you must have had some sort of, um, let me rephrase it slightly in a way that makes me sound slightly less callous. Um, <laughs> Uh, you must have you must have in your mind a, a hierarchy. You must know what stories will resonate with readers or shock readers more than other stories. You, yes, you, no, that's true. So, yes. so there is a sense of not necessarily competition between um, the, the the people dying, but but the but the depth and the nuance of the story or the sheer shock value. Yeah. So you that there's a degree of cynicism there. 
Maybe that's not there, quite the right word. You know, and that, that did happen. I mean, there were some that I knew. Well, it wasn't even me knowing. I mean, there were some that just there was a lot more media interest in. Right. Um, and this would usually be to do with the grisliness of the crime or the, yeah, even or the prettiness where the of the crime victim. Happened. Be, yeah, yeah. yeah, sometimes just who based on who the victim yeah. was or um, exactly where in Texas it happened, when. I mean, it, there were various circumstances. So I usually knew going into it, which were the more, you know, quote unquote, high profile yes. executions. And who who judged your work? I mean, how would would an editor say that was everybody in the town? I mean, no. You know what? It actually got to be much bigger than that. When I was the prison reporter, I would get mail from all over the world. Really? Yes. And I mean, some of it was nice, and a lot of it was not so nice because a lot of people saw me as being abusive. Yes. Because they see you as a well. First of all, you're reachable. Yes. Aren't you? Because you can't really be a journalist without being contactable. That would make life rather difficult. Right. And second of all, as I'm kind of trying to articulate but not completely succeeding, it is almost as if you speak a language we don't understand, that that sense of foreignness or alienness, mm-hmm. so that people would see you as complicit rather than merely right. observing. Exactly. And I got a lot of that, of yeah. people telling me how awful I was for being there. Which and would be like writing to a war correspondent and blaming yes. him for a war, in a way, yes. wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. It used to frustrate me to no end. It, it came most. It was mostly from Europe. Yes. Um, and, of course, you know, Europe mostly being very anti-death penalty, mm. um, it, they were not nice letters. No. And like you said, I mean, my email address was at the bottom of every story I did. So it was uh, very, I would say it was fairly regularly that I started getting um, emails. And then because that year there were so many in 2000 Mm. and Bush is running for for president, we had a lot of foreign media that was there and they were looking at the death penalty. And to them, I was this weird novelty because here I'm this very young girl, really. Mm. I mean, I'm Mm. adult, but Mm. I was a girl. And I'm this young girl who's witnessing execution. So I started having all of these requests from all these foreign reporters to do stories on me, another journalist, which was odd, but they started doing it. And then I got more hate mail. And so it just, um, it was, it was a little bit odd. What would the hate mail accuse you of? What would, can you remember particularly painful well, like you said, being complicit, yes. that I was part of this death machine. Yes. Um, I remember those specific words in a couple of emails. Um, and a lot of people who seemed to think that my writing about it meant that and not even just in being supportive of it, but almost like I was somehow a cheerleader for it. Yes. And it was frustrating because I did make such an effort to go and talk to these inmates every week and get their side of it and everything. So I know it wasn't anything in my writing that was saying that to them. Yes. It's just I don't think I could have done any right in that no, situation. I get that. And it's, it's sort of coming into focus for me now, this 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 the, 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 the dichotomy between it being normal and it being not normal. It's, it's partly why some people, I suspect in Europe, there'll be a different type of fascination with your book than there is at home in America, because yes. we're looking almost for a tour guide rather than a historian, yeah. uh, as it were. Um, so what happened if they didn't want to talk to you? What, what sort of story did you get then if an inmate didn't want to talk to you? Did you still file? Yes. No, you, you would still write a story that the execution um, was scheduled, you know, and it would run usually the morning of the execution. Um, a lot of times, even if the inmate didn't want to talk, I could at least get in touch with their lawyer. So right. I'd still For have a few lines. Yes. I'd still have something from them. Um, and the story would proceed that way. But well, I've, I've, I know we've touched on the notion of them getting things on the record. So I can see from their point of view what it is. Tell me a little bit more about how you because you've given it a lot of thought since I accept Mm. you probably weren't giving it that much thought or this type of thought at the time but how 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 did you perceive your role why were you there what was your purpose in my mind yeah I was there to well represent the public to document what was happening because it it was notable and it was important that This crime had happened, this punishment was handed down, and this person was dying, and it was happening in our town. And so in my mind, I needed to present it that way and present both sides of it so that people could have a full picture of of what exactly was going on and why. How how many of the the, the 40 in that first year went to their death protesting their innocence? I don't remember that. Because it happened. Oh, of course. Every year, any time there were an execution, um, there were some that would protest and and say that they were innocent. Did you ever believe them? No. No. um, You know, people ask me all the time, did I ever see anybody that I thought died? No. 
What I would say, though, is that there were executions I saw that had I been on the jury, I personally would not have voted for the death penalty. I, I didn't, in some cases, think that it was the appropriate punishment for some of the crimes. And and we, we forget that um, that it is the jury that makes that decision in a lot of cases. Yes, yes. Not, and not, it has not, to be capital murder. You know, sometimes people don't realize that. And, and capital murder in Texas is defined as murder in commission of another felony. So rape and murder, kidnapping and murder. Um, it has to be a felony and a murder, although... The murder of a child under a certain age, the murder of a police officer, those are automatic capital murder offenses. You write very powerfully about Napoleon Beasley, who I think was the first person to fit into the category that you've just described as someone you didn't think deserved. That's the right word to use, deserved. You didn't think he deserved to die. Tell us a bit about him. Napoleon was 17 at the time that the crime was committed, and... From all accounts, he was this great student and I think was a student counsel in his class and was a football star and everything. And he fell in with a bad crowd. And they were out and about and they saw this man and his wife and they're driving this Mercedes and they decide that they want this Mercedes, which is really inexplicable. It was not a nice car. It was an old version and everything. But they followed this couple home. And when the couple got out of their car, they ran in and attacked, and uh, the man was shot and killed, uh, John Ludig, and mm. his wife uh, played dead on the floor of the garage, and they stole the car. And so Napoleon was was caught and arrested and charged not too long after. So I got to know him as a reporter and interviewed him several times, and he had a lot of media interest because he had been 17 at the time the crime was committed. And at that time, there was a big push to stop the execution of anyone who was considered a juvenile at the time of the crime. And um, interviewed him a number of times. The execution got a stay, so that was was fine. And then I went to work for the prison system, and he got another date. So this story straddled your two jobs, didn't it? You were a journalist when he was convicted, but you were the public information officer at the facility when the story progressed. Yeah, I was a journalist when he had his first execution date. Right. So I got to know him then because I'm interviewing him for that. Um, he gets a stay of execution. And then I get the job at the prison system. What do you emotionally have invested in that? When you hear that this boy that you quite liked, you'd warmed to, mm-hmm. are you celebrating a bit when you hear he's got a stay? Or can you let yourself get that involved? The first time, not as much because I, I knew him from mm. interviewing him, right. but not that well. Sure. There's a distance so, involved yes, in this. Yes. Yeah. I'm a yeah. journalist. Yeah, and absolutely. so I just met him, you know, once or twice. He's been troubled and, by his age though, surely. You yes. Know, yeah. Just, and when I met him, he was very likable and he was very um, remorseful for what he had done. Mm-hmm. He absolutely accepted responsibility. You know, I, I used to talk to some who would make excuses for why it happened. I mean, he, he didn't do any of that. He was very no nonsense about, yeah, I did this. And I hate that I did it. I'm sorry that I did it and and such. Mm. When I was working for the prison system, he got another execution date. And now all these journalists are wanting to talk to him. So I am setting up these interviews and I'm going every Wednesday to our death row media day. And that's when I really got to know him because I'm seeing him every week now. And in between when these other reporters are talking to him and they're being brought in and out. I'm ta- talking to him, and that's really when I got to know him and thought, I don't I don't really get the sense that if this person were given another chance that he would do something like this again. And I started to struggle with it. But I also felt really guilty for feeling that way because I thought, you know, still there's somebody who – this is yeah. his parents. And his father was shot and killed in his own home – while his mother was laying on the floor playing dead. That's horrible. And so I felt really guilty for rooting for Napoleon because then I was essentially rooting against the victims, and I felt really bad for that. Um, But still, when the execution came up and when that day came and we had to go and talk to Napoleon, me and uh, Larry Fitzgerald, who was the other public information officer, yeah, yeah. Uh, when we had to go talk to him prior to the execution, Larry had made this comment to him where he said, you know, you look very calm. And, and Napoleon said, well, look again. And it just really struck me. And and when it was time to leave, I was really struggling to not cry because I thought, if these officers see this, I'm toast. Yeah. They'll never respect me. Um, just just pause there briefly. It's a, 
because empathy would be seen as a weakness, any form of empathy. I certainly felt it would. Yeah. yeah. Because too, I'm a, I'm a woman doing this job, right, so I already so felt like I had to be. Yes, felt like I had to be tougher anyway. Yeah. You know. So um, after the execution, that was the first time that I did the press conference afterwards because there was so much media there that we couldn't possibly accommodate them all. Right. And so I had to go in and actually conduct the press conference, which was run live on CNN and all these different news programs. And um, that was difficult because I didn't want to see what I had just seen because of how I felt about the case and stuff and the guilt and just it was all in play. So when I left that night, um, that was probably the first time that I actually cried after an execution. Where do you look when it's happening with with somebody like Napoleon, when, when the actual... Um, agent or is making its way into his bloodstream when the moment of death is approaching. Are you looking at him or are you? I did. I, I would still look at them um, because it was my job. I had to oh, because, no. yeah, you know, if if reporters call afterwards, we had to be able to give them that color. If we had to say, you know, he he blinked three times yes. and gasped or he only looked at the ceiling or, you know, we had to be able to say that. So even when it was hard, I mean, we watched. Take us back briefly and talk us through that move from being a journalist to being a, a public information officer. How, how did that happen and why did you want to do it? I, I, can't, I just, I thought the prisons were so fascinating and I really liked covering the beat other than the executions. You right. know, that was, was not my favorite thing to do. But again, I reasoned, it's a few nights, and, and there were a lot that year, but I also thought that was probably an anomaly and that wasn't going to be the norm. And um, just like I had wanted to cover all these features, I thought, you know, if I become the spokesperson, I'm going to start pitching these to all of these reporters who don't know anything else about the prison system. All they see are executions. All they see are escapes and hostages. All, all they and, care about is yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> all they care about is the bad stuff. Yeah. Let's be real. Yes. All they care about is the bad stuff. I wanted them to see some of the good stuff. Yes. You know that at Christmas time at one of the units they um, make toys for for children and you know things like that. I wanted the public to see some of that stuff, so I took it. And br briefly, how much success did you have shining lights into those corners of the system? <laughs> um, the first couple of years, I had some pretty good success. Yeah. Uh, the administration in those early years was very supportive of that. As time went on and, and at the time of my departure, it was not that way. And no. they had gotten very secretive Change and in leadership. shut it down. We, yes. we, we will, we will um, cover that yes. momentarily. I, ju I just want to take you back to some of the um, men that you were... What word do you use? Helping with, watching, working with. What word do you use to describe the for the for the, the inmates? inmates? Yeah, I don't know. Because you did help some, most. I did help many. some. Robert did Coulson help. springs to mind. <laughs> I don't know if I helped Robert Coulson. Robert Coulson just liked me, I think, because I was cheerful and he seemed to like that I smiled a lot. Hi, <laughs> Ms. Lyons. If you are reading this, then they killed me. <laughs> I wanted to tell you that I enjoyed talking to you. You seem like a really great lady. I'm sorry we didn't meet under different circumstances. Thank you for your kindness. Have a wonderful day. Yes. What was hard about that letter is that I received it a few days after the execution. So I remember seeing the envelope and seeing his name on the return and my stomach just dropping because I thought... Beyond the grave. Yes. It was very surreal um, and I had no idea what it was going to say. And he's a good example of that curious contradiction between the person you met and the crime that you knew that person had committed. He'd killed five members of his own family and burnt down the house they were in in the hope of getting an insurance payout. It's, yes. it's almost unbelievably brutal. Horrible crime. Yes, but it, when I met him on death row, incredibly personable and very nice. And as you can see from the letter, very polite and complimentary yes. and such. And yes, it's in those ways, it would be confusing. Um, one of the worst serial killers that we had in Texas was a man named um, Angel Resendez Ramirez. Yes. He was probably one of the most chatty, personable people that I knew. Um, always very complimentary, which could be creepy. Yeah, sure. You know, when he would oh, tell me I looked nice, Whoa. it's like, okay, that's, that's a little much. Yeah. Um, he told me I looked good in red once, and I thought I will never I wear, wear red, red again, again no. for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, Have you? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes, I wear red. <laughs> I never wore it to death row again. No, I can but, imagine. Um, yes, I have worn red. But, um, you know, and yet, uh, yeah, the 
was heinous crimes. Uh, uh, truly you know, heinous. Awful. Were you ever frightened? Um, not, not in the visitation area, just because you're protected by glass. There were a few times not in the visitation area that I was. Um, early in 2000 in covering the executions, there was an inmate named Ponchai Wilkerson who, while he was being executed, started mumbling something, and we couldn't understand what he was saying. And he was doing something odd with his mouth, like he was like twirling his tongue around, and you could see something shiny. And I really, for a second, very ignorantly thought it was a retainer, which mm. made no sense, because why would he have like something to make his yes. teeth straight on death row? But I didn't know. And um, at the moment that he died, he spit this object out, and it landed on his chin. And the warden stepped forward, grabbed this object, sticks it in his pocket. We don't know what it is. Turns out it was a handcuff key. But for just a moment, I thought of the, it was the silence of the lambs moment yeah, where I thought, this man is getting off the gurney. He had a handcuff key. And he's getting off that gurney. And, you know, things are about to get really awful. Sure. And, of course, that's not what happened. He died. But... Um, you know, there's no better way to really kind of give a middle finger to the prison system than to show them spitting out a handcuff key at the moment of your death. That's why he did it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Presumably, and, and it would be remiss of me not to talk about this, presumably there were some fairly horrible final moments. No. As far as, you know, I know in the last year or two in some of the states, they've had some botched executions. I, I don't mean the botching. Oh, I thought you meant like I mean, that. I'm I mean, sorry. I mean the, 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 the terror. Of the oh. inmate. Honestly, that wasn't something you saw. I think one of the things that was so bizarre to me was just how many in, in, the inmates don't fight. So when because they're by the led, time they're there, the fight is over. They're so resigned to right. the fact. Okay. And that was so foreign to me. Yes. So um, when they're asked to leave the holding cell and go to the chamber... I can think of specifically two instances, and I think there might be a third, and I'm not positive I'm remembering it correctly, mm. where the inmate had to be forcibly removed from the cell and taken, you know, fighting to the chamber. Otherwise, they all walked unrestrained. No handcuffs, no on the hands or legs. They walked completely unrestrained, went into the chamber, hopped on the step stool, laid on the gurney, and put their arms out. The, the two rooms, one containing the relatives of the victim the other containing the families of the of the killer. Um, w would there be any uni unifying themes or, or would every one be different? Would, would the f victim's family always or almost always be X and the, and the killer's family would almost always be Y? Or was, it, was there a true tapestry of behaviours from, from, the, from the other witnesses? It usually at least was in the same theme in that there wasn't a ton of emotion on the victim side because, and I write about this, I Do think Do they have a power of veto? Well, interestingly enough, in yeah. the last couple of months, that did occur. Right. Um, there was a case, a man named um, Bart, or Thomas Bartlett Whitaker, Bart Whitaker, and he was convicted of arranging the murders of his family. And he had basically paid some individuals to shoot his mother, father, and brother. And his brother and mother died. His father survived the attack. And he was convicted of capital murder because soliciting capital murder is also a capital yes. offense, given execution um, date. And um, on the day of the execution, the parole board came back and unanimously recommended a commutation of sentence to life. And the governor signed off on it because... His father had successfully convinced them that that was not what he wanted. But that's such a complicated case. Because the son is the Yeah, he's perpetrator. both the inmate's family and the victim. But so I, you wouldn't really, be, that's the only time I can think of. So you wouldn't ordinarily be able to say, hey, look, it was my mum mm -mm. that died. I don't want someone else. To, I don't want someone else's dad to die. No, although of all the executions, I can only really think of one time when afterwards the victim's family said, we really didn't want this. And that's why we're, yeah. we're back again to that yeah. thing of it just being part of the furniture in Texas, yeah. part of the penal and the legal furniture, as opposed yeah. to it being this slightly, I mean, spect spect spectacular almost for people on this side of the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, it, let's talk a little bit, and, and this will lead us to the end of the interview, about where it went wrong because 
I hope you'll allow me to say it sounds to me that you were a great power for good in the penal system, in, <laughs> in, in this institution in particular. Thank you. Um, why do you think that your employers stopped valuing that power for good? If indeed that is what you think. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think that I was probably too open what and do you mean? too transparent. I, I, I knew uh, to be a good spokesperson yes. that my reputation was everything. So there was not one time that I was going to lie to the media. Right. And that didn't mean that I was always going to tell everything I knew. No, because but you there wouldn't tell them something things. untrue just to get Never. to the end of the wire. No. And then towards the end, there were a few instances where it was suggested that that's what I needed to do and I wasn't going to do it. And so I tried my best, you know, not to necessarily defy my bosses, but at the same time, not ruin my reputation. So I just would speak around it. And that wasn't sufficient because I wasn't doing what was asked of me. Um and then, two, there was a, an instance where I had fought because a local crew out of San Antonio wanted to do some filming into the the death chamber. And my point is, these are these are our taxpayers. These are this yeah. this is our media crew in Texas, and they're just trying to shoot this. And I was told no, and I kept fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. And I think it, yeah. those things together, they started thinking that I wasn't, I think, towing the line, if you will. And they um, and that they were also they'd abolished the last meals. Um, for inmates, there was there was a change in tone, a change in almost a sort of calcification, perhaps, on the part of some of your bosses. Yeah, you? and I didn't agree with that at all, and I made that known. But this I, this is the thing that's so interesting, and in that you you I mean, with, with obviously the the people we've discussed who, should we say, managed to get under your um, armor, but actually you were never on the side of the abolitionists. You were never troubled really by the existence of the death penalty in principle so what 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 was your offense just being human as opposed to being an automaton yes right i think so and it took you two years to get justice after they'd finally <laughs> sort of squeezed yes. you out that must have yes. been great fun fighting them through the courts it, that was that's tough because yeah. you know, you're fighting the state of texas essentially um which is of course this massive entity and this Texas Department of Criminal Justice is the largest state employer sure. and all of that. And so you kind of feel it's a little the, David and Goliath little thing going on. Taking your computer. It was constructive dismissal, effectively, yes. to push you to the point where you felt you had no choice but to walk away. Yes. What do you do now, Michelle? Uh, I work in legal marketing. I work uh, for a law firm and do marketing. Totally do, different world. Do you enjoy it? I do. Do you miss any of your old life? Not even a little. I, You know um, what? I do miss working with a journalist. I should say that. Okay. I miss working with a journalist really? and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, not this one. No, I'm kidding. I know. Um, I, uh, I miss some of the correctional officers and the wardens and such. The execution's not even a little bit. We should end, I think, by recognizing that it's actually a two-person story, isn't it? Your book. Yes. It, it is very much... Um, interspersed with thoughts from Larry Fitzgerald, to, to whom you were very close. I mean, you, there's, yes. it's, it's beyond a working relationship. It's a deep and abiding yes. friendship. Yes. Now you're going to make me cry. I was. Well, ah. There's nothing. But deep and abiding <laughs> friendships are good. Yes. But it, it did become clear that he, um, probably for a long time, felt he also had had taken it all in his stride and was coping with it. But he, yeah. he he suffers more than you do. He struggles more than you do with some of the memories and the yeah he did and the thoughts. He did. Yeah, and, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's a male versus female thing. I don't know if it's just our personalities or anything. If I just was able to be a little bit more resilient or bounce back quicker, I'm not sure. But, um, yes, it, it, it upset me a lot to know how much he struggled with it. That's an interesting way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah. That you were upset to realize how upset he was. Yeah, well, because I felt bad that I, I felt – because there's not a lot of people who've been in that position that no. can understand it. And I felt in a way, I guess, that I had failed him by not seeing it. Because it led him. Yeah. Yeah. And your confidence that you are insulated from something like that in your own future is high? Yes. You, you don't yes. think you're going to come back? I think I've got some tissue. <laughs> here, so. That's okay. No, I'm fine. No, I'm well, fine. We're, nearly, we're nearly done. But how, how, <laughs> I mean, how do you know that you haven't got some trauma stored up somewhere inside you that might burst to the surface one day. <laughs> I think that, I mean, there are certain executions that I'll probably never forget, yeah. certainly. And I mean, this experience I'll never forget, you know, and I think that that's clear through the book and stuff. But 
I mean, I think you know. I mean, just for me, I, I don't. I'm not a grim person, and no. I'm not. You know, and I think that overall, that I mean, life is is a beautiful thing. I think that a job like that really shows you. I mean, just how precious it is, and yes, you know that that I just am not going to let that dark period, um, I guess, overshadow the rest of it. Yes, and and the the, the good that you did, the, the, the important work that you did. Thank Final you. question, and possibly <laughs> it should have been the first one. Uh, <laughs> why have you written the book? In a lot of ways, it, it was a kind of a therapy. You know, people always ask, oh, did you go to therapy? No, I didn't. And do I really want it? to? No. Were you offered it? Did, no, no, no. The prison system, I don't think they really think of it that way. No. Um, and it's funny, the, the victims' families, they have this victim services division, and they stay with them and make sure that they're counseled to. And the inmates' families have the chaplaincy department that ministers to them. But yeah. the, the staff members, no. not just us, but the Gods, officers everyone. and mm. the chaplains, we don't really have anything, you know, we're there, but no, they don't really offer. So there is, so you use the word therapy. You're acknowledging that there is something that needs to be addressed. And I I suppose others might use the word treated, but it's not something that worries you or scares you. No, because I think that doing the book allowed me to do that. I think for me, whenever I have any problem Mm. or something that's troubling me, it's usually because I don't know how to organize it in my mind. And doing this helped me do that. Um, Just calms the chaos. Yes. Yes. Instead of having all these faces with names that I can't remember, or I remember this crime, but I'm not positive it happened here and things like that. Going through these files and remembering it while it was hard also helped me to put a lot back in order. So what was the difference between the Michelle Lyons who started writing this book and the Michelle Lyons who finished it. <laughs> My mind is probably lighter. You know, it's now on paper, so I can kind of close the book and move on. Indeed. Michelle, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. No, thank thank you. you so much. Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.